this seems like a really punctual group. I don't see anyone in the waiting room now, but I'm happy to keep um, admitting them as they arrive. And, um, and I'll hand it over to Connie Carter, the founder and director of Operation Breaking Stereotypes. Um, and just a quick background, uh, over a year, I guess about a year ago almost, um, at the Educate Maine conference, I got to hear Connie and some amazing students from um, Moranicook High School, Old Town Middle School, Indian Island Middle School, um, were a few of the schools I remember talking about the impact that uh, the Operation Breaking Stereotypes program had had on their lives as, as students. And um, I was so inspired by that. This was this was before um, we knew for sure what this year's conference theme was, but even back then, I think I shot an email to Connie or at least captured her um, contact information uh, because it felt like this would be such a good program to share with island and coastal teachers uh, who, don't, who aren't already familiar with it. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Connie, and I'll let you take over. Thank you so much, Krista, and thank everybody for joining me. Um, I will say, first of all, I hope that all the tech goes as I planned, and will. Um, I ask your forgiveness in advance <laughs> if it doesn't. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen here so, and while I talk. Um, hold on. And wait a second. Is everybody able to see that okay? Yes? Great. Um, so um, just a little background on Operation Breaking Stereotypes. First of all, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, back in 2001, I was teaching at Orono High School and my daughter was teaching at a high school in the Bronx. And we had one of those Sunday afternoon mother-daughter conversations about our different schools and our students. And it became pretty clear to me that um, even though our students lived in really different situations and had different daily experiences, that they also had a lot of similarities that, and that they didn't realize they had those similarities. And so we concocted this crazy plan to um, connect our two schools. Uh, we each had an advisory group of about 15 students. And so we asked them to write an essay about how they got to be who they are today and, um, and then match them based on those essays. So um, if Krista had been my partner, I would have gotten her essay, she would have gotten mine. And that's what we would have known about each other before we met. Um, and the first exchange was in, um, when we went to New York City, Orno students went to New York City. And when I went to the Orno school board to ask their permission to be able to travel. And at that time we had planned that students would actually, it would, the exchanges were like long weekends, Thursday to Sunday. And students were to stay with their host, their partner's family, and then go to school with their partner. And then we did activities as a whole group. And um, the Orno School Board said, great, you can do this, but you certainly can't stay with a family in the Bronx because it's a little too scary. So not to be deterred, I said, fine, we'll stay at um, a hostel. So we did. And we had an amazing connection with those um, 30 students. They were in incredible and kind of came together with openness and excitement and um, questions and all sorts of things. And um, at one point, we, because we were going to New York City, I had planned every second of every day because having 30 high school students in New York City, I didn't want to lose anybody. And we, one of the things we decided to do was to go to the Museum of Natural History. And after about 20 minutes of being in the museum, the adults all said, wait a minute, um, have you seen any kids? 
and nobody had seen any kids inside the museum. So we decided maybe we should go outside and see what was going on. So we went outside and they were all on the sidewalk. They were seeing, they were teaching, doing break dancing and they were seeing who could hail a cab faster, a white kid or a black kid. And um, they were doing all the things that maybe would, we would have wanted them to do, but wouldn't have put in an itinerary. Um, and then later that day, one of the Bronx students asked if, he said, would it be okay if I invited everybody over to my apartment for pizza and listening to music? And I said, sure, but you might want to check with your mom. Um, and so he called his mom and she said, um, how many? And he said, uh, 15. And she said, wait, are those those white kids from Maine? They are going to shoot me up just like the Columbine students did. And I thought I could hardly wait to get back and share that story with um, the Orno school board and Orno parents who were so nervous and sort of help open their eyes to the fact that fear goes both ways and stereotypes go both ways. And that what we were trying to do was to really um, counteract those ideas and those feelings. So, so that's a little bit about our beginning. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of quotations that kind of um, describe in essence what we're doing. And the first one is, I want you to be connected about your next door neighbor. Do you know your next door neighbor? By Mother Teresa. And I think so often we don't know our next door neighbors and whether those next door neighbors are literally right next door or whether they're the town next to us or um, the, you know, the state next to us or the country next to us, we tend to function in our own little bubbles. And I realized this even more after, you know, we did several rounds of um, exchanges with students and I would watch students come back and instead of, and they were all about difference and everything when they were with their New York City partners. And then they would come back and they would not understand the difference of a student next to them who may be dressed different or who had a special need or whatever. And I thought, wait a minute, we've got a lot of work to do, which is sort of what I think we're all here today trying to think about equity. Um, and, and racial equity is certainly really in the forefront right now, right now but all sorts of equity. And then it's very important to know the neighbor next door and the people down the street and the people in another race. And I also feel like this is one of the, you know, it's, I think it's hard to go outside your own little bubble and to figure out how to be able to do that. And so that's kind of one of the goals that Operation Breaking Stereotypes has is to help students be comfortable addressing difference and looking at difference. And we did continue to do um, our exchanges as part of Orno High School and uh, um, Walton High School in the Bronx for a couple of years and then decided that maybe this was such a cool idea that we should form a nonprofit um, and spread it to other schools. So we have done that and have since in the past 19 years worked with a about 3,500 students. Um, and I'll talk more a little bit about how we've evolved as we go forward. And so typically um, when I meet with a group like you all, I have you introduce yourselves by name and your school and your subject or area that you're involved in. Um, and I would really love to have you put that in the chat. But also when I meet with students, they we do that, but we also um, find that there are some ways that things that we could share about ourselves that will maybe open up who we are just a little bit. And um, one of the ways that I oftentimes have students introduce themselves is to talk about their favorite food. Um, so it's like, my name is Connie and my favorite food is anything that has pesto in it. Um, or so, and then a saying that you hear around your house. Um, and so you know, a typical saying that I um, would hear is, wait, have you let the dog out yet? <laughs> so, um, but asking students to share that. And that opens up so many ways of talking with kids that, um, and I would encourage you to do that with your own group of students, um, not just with students that are maybe connecting with another group outside of your school, but um, it gives kids a way to kind of understand 
where they're coming from um, and really opens up some great conversations. So please feel free to put that in the chat. Um, that would be awesome if, um, if you feel so inclined. So I've talked a little bit about how um, we started and we continued for quite a few years to work with schools in Maine and New York City and Boston. Um, and that was, that takes a leap of faith for both groups, I think, to say, wait, as a Maine student, Maine students tend to be really excited about going to New York City, um, but they maybe weren't quite as excited about going to the Bronx or going to Brooklyn. Um, and so we had to make it really clear that this was not a trip this was not a sightseeing trip to go to the Empire State Building or Times Square or whatever, but it was a, an opportunity to see um, how somebody else in that um, area lives. And likewise, students coming to Maine were petrified, honestly, because most of them were students of color and they had not, many of them had great experiences with white people and so they were really nervous about what it was going to be like to be staying with a white family and um, what that would look like. So a little bit about the process um, and I will just share that this um, picture on this slide is from our experience at Educate Maine. It's three of the middle school students who spoke there and if we were able to all be together I would have had them come and talk to you as well but it's was a little, it's been a little challenging to, to gather people together, um, especially students who are in school and trying to figure out their hybrid schedule and their Zoom schedule and their remote schedule. So here's the picture. They're an awesome group of students. So the process is where each school um, builds a cohort of ideally 10 to 15 students and they and I always leave that up to the school to decide how to do that, whether they want it to be an advisory, whether they want it to be a, an after school club, whether they want it to be part of a class. Um, I leave that to the school. And that cohort independently works on stereotypes and um, identity. So they talk a lot about, you know, groups that have stereotypes and then they talk about their own identity and, um, and all the things that make up our identities. And that in itself, if you only do that, opens um, students' eyes to so many things around them because sometimes they don't realize what the stereotypes are that they're um, experiencing every day. Or, you know, I asked a group of students just the other day to look at kind of where they thought stereotypes existed and they couldn't come up with anything. And then I sent them away with that mission and they all came back with all the things that show up on social media, on TikTok, on Instagram, um, and were kind of in their own way blown away by the things that appear on those platforms. And then um, after the cohort has a chance to kind of gel together and, and get to feel comfortable with each other. Then we start the building of connections with the partner cohort. And we do that mostly through writing and then eventually in person. Um, so they do a lot of writing as a group. So they'll write about whatever the stereotypes that they think people have about their community, the stereotypes they have about the partner community. They write um, as a group Oh, things that people wouldn't know if they first met them, um, things that are important to them, things they, that are critical about their own identity, about their school, about their community. And they send that all as, um, without defining that it's from any particular person, to the partner school and share those back and forth. And then eventually they do the same writing that they've done for the past 19 years, writing about how they got to be who they are today and just focusing on a couple of things that really have made an impact in their lives and um, shaped who they are. And then the adults in the group read all of those essays and um, then decide how they will partner people. Um, and the partners are, hold on here. So they are usually the same gender if they're um, staying 
in each other's families or if or we try to um, be sensitive to, to that situation. And then if they are um, in the past, oh golly, about six years, we've done exchanges within Maine, which tend to be just a, a one day or an overnight exchange. And those are a little bit more fluid as far as how we assign partners. But we still try to pick not just ways that they're exactly alike, but way, things that they might have in common, but also things that they might have that would be different that would help them grow. And so I just wanted to share a couple of reflections from original OBS students. And these were sent to me just not that long ago and kind of came to me out of the blue as a result of the kind of racial pandemic that's going on right now. So I was really thrilled to get some of these. And the first one is, we not only got to experience life outside of our little bubble, but we saw ourselves in each other. We experienced the same things in our high school years and it had zero to do with our religion, ethnic background, or even the color of our skin. We all came together and learned so much from each other. I believe we all became better people because of it. And that's a Bronx student who sent that. And then this came from an Orono student. Being a part of the very first group of student exchanges between our school and a high school in the Bronx not only opened my eyes to how different, but also similar, the lives of students in different places could be. But more importantly, gave me a structured way to talk about race with my peers for the first time ever. The guided conversations we had about difference, privilege, assumptions, stereotypes, power, identity, and race unlocked a way of thinking and seeing the world that has stayed with me ever since. Especially in these present times of racial reckoning, I'm grateful to have been introduced to these ideas at such an early stage in my development as a young adult. And I think that speaks a little bit to what Yvonne was talking about at the beginning, about how, especially growing up in a lot of places in Maine where um, the population is primarily white, we tend not to think about race um, and we don't know how to have those conversations. And so to all of a sudden be in a place where you have to think about that and you are guided in the way you think about it and the conversations you have, maybe it's a little bit safer than just, you know, throwing you to the dog, so to speak, and, and kind of having to land there on your own. Um, so as I mentioned, about six years ago, we started doing partnerships within Maine because it became really clear to me that even though we can say Maine is mostly white, we are growing, um, have a growing population of BIPOC people. And um, so I decided that it would be great to kind of try to connect some of those populations and help them understand that um, right next door, our neighbors are maybe look different from us, but have a lot of things in um, common. So what I'm going to try to do now, and the miracle will be if it works, is to share with you just a short um, video clip of a news broadcast that was done about the partnership between Lewiston High School and Moranica Community High School that were, you know, 45 minutes apart, but had never really experienced each other's lives or crossed into those boundaries. So bear with me. Whoops. And please tell me the power is flickering here. Don't lose the power. You're one of the smartest and kindest people I know. When Operation Breaking Stereotypes started between Lewiston and Miranda Cook four years ago, the students involved had no idea what they were getting into. The only things I had heard about Lewiston were like bad things. Lewiston kids were convinced that Miranda Cook kids would be really racist and would say, you know, racist slurs to them. Five, four, three, two, one. It's misconceptions like those that drive this program. Today, most of the students are getting ready to graduate. 
We met them as they gathered as a group one last time. I mean, they're amazing kids. I mean, they've, they've grown immensely in just those four years, starting as freshmen. The two high schools are in the same area, but the similarities end there. Marina Cook is a small rural school and almost entirely white. <laughs> Lewiston has a much more diverse student population, including many new Mainers. As a child of an immigrant, it's hard for me to adjust to like this foreign land. I, I'm very new. Like I didn't know how to greet people. I didn't know how to kind of adjust like the culture here. Each student was assigned a partner from the other school. Over the years, the pairs have shared stories, visited one another's homes, and talked a lot about diversity and acceptance. But I feel like if people like us like, continue to do what we do, it can change. It turns out they have a lot more in common than they thought at first. We all tell the same jokes. We all have the same classes and the same problems like day to day. The bonds and connections formed through this program extend well beyond the program itself. Many of the students who otherwise wouldn't have crossed paths now consider themselves close friends. And they even came to one of my lacrosse games sophomore year at Lewiston, and they came and supported me. Man, that second year, it was incredible. I mean, I remember at the end of the year, Connie, Peter, and I looked at each other after we met at Thomas, and we're just like, that felt like one big family. The students also recognize it's a special connection. Then the day... It's a, it's a fun little get-together, and you grow together as a family. Sam and RJ are both going to UMaine Orono in the fall. They plan to stay close into college and beyond. This program has been, like, a really great tool for me to, like, make friends and, like, kind of discover, like, the culture that's here that's different from what I grew up in. And thank you for being my partner. For those involved, that's the true measure of success. I think one student said, I feel closer to my partner than I feel to a lot of my friends back at my school. For WMTW News 8, I'm Tyler Cataract. And we'll get back there eventually. All right. Back, kind of. And for some reason, those four little um, over next to the down at the bottom, you can make it full screen again if you'd like. Um, oh, got it. Yes. Yeah. Right there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, that's just a little example of. Um, what it was like to connect two main schools um, who were so close together and yet had so many different, had, had never crossed each other's boundaries actually. And they did become like a family um, that was pretty, pretty powerful to watch and really interesting. Um, our current partnerships are, um, although taking some interesting turns because of COVID, but are the Indian Island School, Leonard Middle School, in Old Town and Orono Middle School, and then Lewiston High School and Marana Cook, um, Gorham High School and Westbrook, and the Brooklyn School in Maine and Arts and Letters Academy in Brooklyn, New York, because they were all intent on doing a Brooklyn to Brooklyn exchange. So while some of those partnerships are right now trying to figure out how it's going to work and how they're, they're in the middle of kind of even just beginning to figure out how to do school, um, we're hopeful that they'll all go forward eventually as the school year progresses. So speaking of connecting people close by, it had always been a dream of mine ever since OBS started actually, um, to connect Orono, Old Town and Indian Island because I live in Orono and I have experienced the, A, the stereotypes about Old Town and Indian Island and Orono. And the fact that those three communities rarely connect. Um, so I was thrilled about, oh, five years ago now, um, when those three schools agreed to become an OBS partnership. And the journey has been interesting. Um, I, when we first, when I first approached Indian Island School about being part of the partnership, they were pretty suspicious of me as a white woman coming in. And they basically, one of the teachers there said to me, I really thought all you wanted us to do was to drum and dance for you. And that was a big um, eye opener for me to realize how 
maybe rightly so, um, a lot of Native people are suspicious of white people, that we come to them for the wrong reasons, that we don't acknowledge that we're on their land, as we did so wonderfully at the beginning of this conference, um, and, and that it's really important um, not to expect them to educate us, that we need to do a lot of our own education in that regard. So um, when that group first came together, they talked about things in common. They talked about, in the first year, I think we talked about climate change, and then we talked about school safety. And then finally, um, last year, they talked about what um, the components of their three communities are and how the three towns have come together through them. And they wrote this great song that I'm going to share for you now. Basically, they wrote the lyrics to the song and then there were three high school students who um, helped them compose the melody and helped them perform it. So here we go with any luck again. We're getting there. This always happens for some reason. Not the same. Oh, 
So that's just a little Slow bit of a trail again. Whoa, this is the best. Hold on. Ah, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, so that's just an example of three communities who thought they had nothing in common and the kids came together and wrote that song and um, they feel such ownership of that and they shared that with their school boards and their town councils and um, tribal councils and managed to connect, I think, in a way at a level that maybe they hadn't connected before. So you don't have to look too far um, to be able to to make connections outside of a comfort zone. Um, I just wanted to give you a couple of ways to start working on things like this, if um, even within your own schools, to build awareness. Um, the first one is called the web of stereotypes, and you may have done this, but uh, basically I start by having students brainstorm all the groups that normally get stereotyped and they come up with a very long list usually they start with ethnicities and religions and races and then we move to old people and young people and jocks and nerds and um, people with special needs and, um, and all sorts of various permutations of any group that could be stereotyped and then i ask them to stand in a circle and I usually choose two groups that we're going to talk about the stereotypes. And so it could be um, jocks and nerds, as I have here. It could be old people, young people. It could be people with disabilities and, and um, people who are considered like the popular groups in their schools. Um, but let's take jocks and nerds for, uh, to start. Um, I ask each student, I assign each student um, to be one of those, so a jock or a nerd. And then I ask each student to think about a stereotype about the opposite group. So if you're a jock, you think about a stereotype that might exist about a nerd. If you're a nerd, you think about a stereotype that exists about a jock. And then we start with one student holding a ball of yarn <clears throat> and have that student share the stereotype of the other group. And then the student tosses the yarn to the a student across the circle who shares another stereotype and they do that until um, all students have had a chance to speak and what you've created in the middle is this web of stereotypes or a web of yarn and it makes it very clear then in the processing um, every time I ask students, so what does this show you basically they always say this shows how stereotypes keep us from getting to the real people and so it's a really simple but powerful way to um, start talking about stereotypes with a group and start thinking about identity or thinking about um, how we move forward to equity and what makes us um, kind of be able to see the real people, see the um, book through the cover. Another one that I've used a lot, and some of you may have used Facing History in Ourselves, which I highly recommend that you look at if you haven't, um, is an 
um, an activity called Jesus Cologne, Little Things Are Big. And it talks about, it's the, um, a reporter for the New York Times back in the 60s who was on a subway late at night and he and a white woman with a couple of children and she had suitcases were the only people on the left on the car and when they stopped and she was getting off at the same top stop he was he agonized about whether or not to help her um, with her children and the suitcases and everything get off because he was because he was afraid that um he wasn't sure if she would accept the help or if she would kind of start screaming that a person of color was approaching her and trying to do something that he certainly wasn't trying to do. And he made the decision not to help. And, but also talks later in the piece about how if he had that to do over again, he would certainly help her and hope that she would accept the help. After reading through that piece or listening to it, I asked students to think about real and assigned identities. First for Jesus Colon. So how does he see himself and what are the adjectives that they would list as ways that he would describe himself? And he, in the piece, talks about how he's educated, how he always, he's a reader, he's kind, he's all of those um, things, and, and that he's Puerto Rican and that he's black. Um, and then I asked them to think about what are the identities that have been assigned to him by others? And, um, and they you know, come up with all sorts of things, scary, um, a, a, maybe a, um, a, a robber or you know, all, all sorts of things that aren't quite as positive. And we talk about that, about how that happens in life all the time. And then I ask them to make their own list of their real and assigned identities. And that is a really powerful thing to do with kids if you um, feel like you want to take that on. Um, because it begins to show how we think of ourselves, but how others assign identities to us. And that sometimes we just live with those, sometimes we try to counteract them, um, but it's important especially in a group, if students feel comfortable with each other, sharing that so that they become yet another, it's another level of understanding of who they are and who we are as people. And I wanna just share um, one of these videos. This is another way that you can have people think about um, assumptions for others. Hopefully this will work. Past, but how quickly it 
you are what you see. This Jewish girl and this Muslim girl are far more similar than our religion would like us to believe. So it's not hard to realize that we're not the same thing. Movies. And that we both Head over heels. This year, boy. Jewish boy. Did you meet him at the mosque? That little Palestinian girl and that little Israeli girl will never get to be asked these questions. Never get to discover whether they had the same favorite movies or whether they were both going to become poets, performing on stages like this one. And we may not have either. Had we let the way the world sees us get in our way, we are connected. We are one. Like God and I. Like Allah. Like, like God. So that is just an example of something to maybe share with students to get them to start thinking about um, how people characterize others and how we look at others. And even though it, you know, might not, they might not be Jewish or Muslim, but to think about ways that we oftentimes um, put our assumptions onto other people and that keeps us from connecting with each other. So, because last spring, all of a sudden, we were thrown into this time where everybody all of a sudden was at home and remote learning. Um, some of the partnerships that OBS had kind of stopped right at that point in March because it was too challenging for school to kind of try to figure out remote learning and um, how to keep OBS going when it was kind of an after school activity or whatever. So, but some schools did stay together and um, the video that I want to share with you is from middle school students from Orno and Old Town and Indian Island. And they, I asked them after looking at this video that you just watched to think about three words that describe how other people see them. And then to talk about the assumptions that people make about them because of those words. And then to think about three words that they would use to describe themselves. And then we created this video to share with um, their school board, their town government, and other community groups. So I'll um, you look at this right now. tries to divide us by thinking that everyone in Orono is rich and preppy. By thinking that everyone in Orono is educated. By thinking that everyone in Old Town are druggies and they're sketchy. By thinking that everyone in Indian Island is primitive, lives off the land, and wears feathers. I get caught up in the way the world sees me. Odd, smart, funny, and happy. Loud, quiet. Soft, shy, perfect. Muslim. The world assumes I'm an incredible math student that knows all the answers. The world assumes I'm loud because when I'm with my friends, I talk a lot. The world assumes I always know what to say. The world assumes I'm bossy because I stand up for what I believe in. They think that just because I wear glasses, that makes me naturally smart. They don't seem to notice that I'm really non-independent, scared, shy, clueless sometimes, serious, determined. I have a fiery attitude. I'm really introverted, thoughtful, and cautious, considerate, empathetic, funny, and creative, passionate about everything that I do. We are OBS. We are OBS. We are OBS. We see a new world, a connected one. So that's something that you can do in your with your own students that ended up being a really powerful um, activity that connected them in ways that I hadn't thought about. And then I just have listed here so that you'll get um, when this is all shared. Other topics and resources that you can discuss, the danger of a single story, some of you may have already seen that, talking about um, how when we just conceive of people in one way that that really limits um, how our ability to connect with each other. And another one on language and identity, it's talking specifically about um, indigenous people and what's happened to them with their language and how that strips away identity sometimes when your, your language is taken away from you. And then another um, 
quick video about the first time I realized I was and whatever part of your identity you want to um, think about. This one happens to be black and female, but it's uh, it's another activity that I've done with students just to think about parts of their identity and then the first time they realized they were whatever that part is. And then a, a final link to the Penobscot Nation ambassador, Molly and Dana, talking about her youth and her path towards activism and specifically talking about how she kind of took on the whole Native American mascot piece in our um, state and eventually has um, that has led to Native American mascots being um, banned. So I, just with closing thoughts, I think, um, I guess, you know, we started Operation Breaking Stereotypes with this kind of bigger connection between Maine and New York City, and um, then have kind of we not shrunk it down, but moved closer to each other so that we're not only doing Maine and New York City, but also doing Maine with, within Maine, and then communities that are really close within Maine. And I think you could probably do it just within your own school with different groups. Um, so I, these are challenging times. Um, equity is a really, really important topic. Racial equity is incredibly important. And I think even as we start, I know this year as I'm working with um, schools and students within Maine, I'm asking them to think about um, the times that race gets in the way of somebody accomplishing something. And we've done some pretty, had some pretty interesting discussions and also asking them to think, to go to their own communities, their school boards, their police force, their um, town government and ask what are they doing now that racial equity seems to be much more in the forefront of our discussions. What are those communities doing and how can the students get involved in that? So I would love to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I would love to have anybody ask questions, comments, thoughts. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> Just the, the silent applause is always, you know, <laughs> part of the Zoom experience. But um, and those I've I've watched uh, a few of those videos before, and I'm still um, very moved by them. So in case anyone's internet connection was holding them up, and you'd like to revisit any of them, I am finally going to share a sneak peek to the ITC Google Drive, um, where I've already put your presentation, um, Bonnie, into. Uh, the workshop one folder that folks will see there. So that's the Google Drive that we'll be sharing afterwards. It'll be a lot more populated, um, but yeah, thank you. And I'd be more, yeah, Jessica. Hi, um, thank you. The, um, the um, presentation where the two students were side by side, um, is that something that you helped Hap make happen or is that yeah. something you used as a resource? I use that as a resource. That's from a thing called Button Poetry. Um, and the link is um, in the just in the slide presentation okay. so you can use it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Caitlin. Hi, first I just wanted to say thank you so much. The work that you're doing seems incredible. Um, I work at a very small island school in a one room schoolhouse. And I was wondering, so we're part of the TLC, which is the Outer Islands teachers kind of all come together over Zoom. Um, I only have one middle schooler at the moment, but I would love to get them involved in something along these lines. Is there a way, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot, um, <laughs> but would there be a way for a very small rural school in a very small rural community to be a part of this? Absolutely. Um, I think we should probably talk separately to figure out how to make that happen. I would love to. Um, and there are, I think, island schools and off-island schools are probably a really good place to start with connecting because there's lots of stereotypes. I'll just, um, this is a really short um, example, but way back Deer Isle um, was participating in this program with um, Lewiston and Brooklyn, New York. And it was interesting that 
the two groups of kids that had the most to kind of overcome for stereotypes were the Deron and the Lewiston kids, because they were just shocked that they existed in the same state and didn't even know where each other was. So um, I would love to talk to you more. I'll put my contact information in the chat and um, please contact me. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, Yvonne. Sure. I, I heard you say that, um, that, that it sounds like there's different ways that different schools do this, that it, it's part of a class, it was part of your class, and then it can be an after school program. Can you just talk a little bit about how, um, how you've seen it work and, and if, in terms of just like how you get it into a school and where it can live and how it can sort of compete with all of the other things that, that are going on? Um, I will say that when we um, quit our jobs and formed this nonprofit, we thought, oh, every school on the planet is going to want to do this. And that is not true. <laughs> um, and that that's probably the most challenging part is to figure out how to make it fit in a school. And I think what I've found is what can kind of drive the best success is if there is a teacher, advisor, whatever, within the school who really believes in this idea. And then I leave it to that teacher to kind of figure out how to best make it work. And some, some schools have done it, um, they've opened it up to the whole school and had students apply and write an essay about why they want to do it. Some schools have just said, this is my advisory and I really want to do this. And so they kind of do it through an advisory. Some schools do it as a, you know, an, um, like it's during an advisory time, but it's a separate group. So it really depends on, on the school. And, but I think the driving force has to be that there's somebody in that, I mean, I can't make schools kind of want to do this. There has to be somebody within the school that really is passionate about seeing the need. I don't know if that answers that. It does, question. it does. And, and it's, yeah. And, and just that idea that, that yeah, it, it needs to be some, at least one person that can like push through all the barriers um, that because may. Because you're right, there are a lot. There's, yeah. you know, you're competing. With, sometimes it has worked to do it as part of a, like a social studies class or a yeah. civics class or something like yeah. that. Just a quick connection. Years ago on Vinyl Haven, which is where I live and where I used to work, um, we did a place-based and project-based learning collaborative with Vinyl Haven and a, um, a group of in inner city schools in the Boston area, including exchanges of kids going to different places and forming those really amazing connections and having the sort of home experience. And it was around this sort of curriculum piece, um, but the the sort of, um, I mean, I guess, I guess this work is, should, is curriculum, but it felt, it, the, the, the real value of it felt like this much more like personal growth and breaking down stereotypes and the, the, the actual content and the curriculum that we wrote and having binders was great, but there was this, for those students who participated on both the more urban kids and the island kids, it was just kind of life-changing. Um, so yeah, that, that's, it's really, it's really amazing to see. And, and thank I, you so much. I always for say that, you know, schools, and it's just what you just said, that schools try to focus on making sure this is part of the curriculum or that there's some learning standards there somewhere. And that we do that part pretty well in schools for the most part. What I think sometimes we don't do is the social emotional learning piece. Yeah. Um, and this is like off the charts when right. it comes to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think maybe that's changing and SEL is going to have its time yeah. in the in the school day, not just off to the side or, you know, right. if the guidance counselor gets to it. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? I, thanks, Connie. And that was great. I really appreciated it. And I just appreciated the whole presentation too, like all of the visuals and the, just a lot of emotions <laughs> coming up for yeah. me, which was great. I definitely remember all of this. Um, so just curious, and you m probably mentioned this and it just missed me, but what is the, what is the youngest age of the kids that you've worked with or that have been involved in this program? Um, usually six, we start with middle school, sixth grade okay. through high school. Okay. And Not then we couldn't do it with younger, but it gets complicated when they have to travel and stay with other people. And yeah. 
Uh, thank you. And uh, just wondering too, you just mentioned this too, of like, you know, maybe a, a class doing this or um, I'm just wondering, in, in, and it probably ranges, but um, participation, um, you know, that I'm just thinking of like these very small schools, like to see who will opt in, you might have two people, right, that might opt in. So um, I'm just curious of like, have there been um, situations where you, you've worked with groups of students who, you know, that it was sort of mandatory that they do this program or project? And what was that like versus the um, kids who, you know, are eager to opt in? So um, last year we started working with the Brooklyn School in Maine, um, and that was a mandatory, it was their social studies class, um, all eight of them. <laughs> um, and they had varying degrees of, you know, kind of buy-in initially, but as we went forward, they, I think, felt more and more comfortable with kind of letting down some of their guard. Unfortunately, when the pandemic hit, and this is a really interesting um, comment, that, and people went, that school went remote, as we all did. And so the teacher um, sent me a, we had a conversation and she basically said, I think I have to stop doing this right now until I can be back face to face with them because the topics that are coming up are too um, kind of, I guess, challenging or um, a little bit scary for kids to do in a remote setting. So, um, so that was a kind of a, an interesting eye opener to me about the importance of maybe having, when you really start talking about this, it's challenging to do it on a, um, a remote setting, unless you have a really, if you have a really strong relationship with your students, yes, but um, that's, that's the challenge. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Molly. Hi, um, thank you very much for that presentation. That was really wonderful. Um, I'm wondering if you have um, connected with any f um, teachers in Washington County um, or if there's been any interest in um, teachers in that area. I work a lot with teachers there and I think that this might be something really good for um, some schools in those communities. So several years ago, I did a um, work with Mano and Mano um, and brought um, students from Narraguegas High School to Mano and Mano. It was students who were kind of connected to Mano and Mano and then other than white students that were at Narraguegas. Um, and that was a, a great, that lasted for a year. And then it became clear that the, the logistics were difficult to get transportation for people to kids to come to Mano and Mano and to kind of figure that all out. So then we started um, working at Narraguegas and that became complicated because of the um, stipulations that the administration put on when we could meet and how we could meet. And so it kind of fell apart, but I have since, I've connected with Brittany Ray there. I don't know if you know Brittany. Um, and so we're kind of back trying to make something work there, but yes, I would love to do more in Washington County. <laughs> 